Okay, I'm going to also mute everyone. And I will unmute you, Richard, you're unmuted. Great. Okay. All right, welcome everyone to another edition of Fired Up, the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass education series for glass lovers. Um, we have an incredible master artist with us today, Richard Whiteley, also an incredible educator that I would love to learn from someday. Um, but before we get started, just a few quick words. Um, we do have a YouTube channel, so I encourage you to go to YouTube, search for Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass and if you have missed any of our sessions in the past, you can see all of those events on the YouTube channel. I also encourage you to go to the website and check out our membership because we have an organization full of international members and a lot to offer. Um, we will put that website in the chat room for you as well. And as we go along, uh, if you do have questions for Richard, please feel free to ask. Um, I only ask that you put them in the chat window and I will make sure that we get to them throughout the program. All right, with that, I think we are ready to get started. Uh, Richard, it is off to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Demetra, uh, Howard, and everyone with the Art Alliance of Contemporary Glass. Um, really enjoyed the opportunity to, be, um, to, to speak with you today. And um, I've got uh, uh, quite a long presentation. I'll talk a little bit today about my work and my research. Particularly, I'll, I'll do a deep dive into my thinking and studio practice and talk a little bit about some of the research projects that I've been involved with over the years. Um, and some that have come out of my, my teaching. <clears throat> I come from Australia and much of my time in Australia was spent here in Canberra at the School of Art and Design at the nation's capital. Um, I was a student here in the 1980s and also headed the program for almost 18 years from 2002 to late 2019. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that during, during the presentation today. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit later later today about, um, oh, just having trouble moving this around. Sorry guys, I'm technically challenged here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, joining the team here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Shortly before the pandemic, um, I moved here to work with Amy Schwartz and her team in the studio and um, I'm delighted to be here and I was recruited to, to work with them as part of a major expansion that we're, we're trying to achieve here. Um, more about that a little bit later. I wanted to start by talking about the, the, the country of Australia where I've spent most of my life. Obviously it's a very beautiful country and I wanted to highlight the unique sense of light and space within the Australian landscape because it's, an, it's, it's a uh, phenomena that a number of artists have drawn upon in, in their practices. In fact, this, this is Manly Beach and I used to share a studio in the mid nineties with people uh, like Ben Eadles and Kathy Elliott. Can, can you go see my cursor? Oh, no one can speak. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So our studio was back here, about three streets back from this surf beach in the mid 1990s. Ben Eadles, Kathy Elliott, Bettina Vicenton, Harriet Schwarzrock, um, uh, Matt Curtis, uh, and a few others, I'm forgetting their names, but um, we shared a studio there and it was a, a really wonderful experience. Um, the Australian landscape also away from the beautiful coast is, is, is vast and a lot of the interior of Australia seems like this kind of endless void. Many visitors comment on the size of the sky that seems to dwarf everything around it. This is an image that I took of the, uh, on a drive between Canberra and Adelaide, two major uh, centres for contemporary glass in Australia. And it's about half away along that trip. It's the Hay Plain. And it's like much of Australia. It's, it's vast and it looks um, particularly empty on the, in the middle there. And as you take this drive, you, um, you also go through a beautiful little town called Wagga Wagga, 
which hosts the, na uh, the National Collection of Glass Art. This is an image of the night sky in Australia. And you can see just here, this is the Southern Cross. And the Australian Aboriginal, like many cultures, uh, see celestial figures in, in the night sky. And one of the um, important uh, Aboriginal characters is a mythical emu called Dinawan. And he's the dark emu. Most cultures define celestial characters by stars, but Dinawan is elusive. And he's actually defined by the dark spaces between the stars amongst the Milky Way and near the Southern Cross. You can actually see these dark patches here and down here, they make up the body of this uh, mythical emu. And I feel that Dinawan seems so fitting to the whole concept of Australian landscape and its relationship to space. The Aboriginal people many thousands of years ago had defined this character as part of their creation story, the dream time. And what I respond to, obviously, given the nature of my work is this idea of this empty space or this empty void, um, which is uh, so much a part of the Australian experience. I don't think you can grow up in Australia and not be influenced by its landscape. Uh, another key influence on me is glass itself, and I've worked in glass for, for most of my life. Uh, I started an apprenticeship when I was 16 years old, and this is a, a stained glass window that I worked on. It was the first commission that I worked on. And I did my apprenticeship in a small rural town in uh, country Victoria, outside the, of the city of Melbourne. And when I was in high school, we had a visiting artist who came and we're doing this little stained glass project. And he gave us a talk on contemporary stained glass. I had no concept of contemporary glass. I'd not seen anything like it before, but I was spellbound by what he showed us. And um, he said at the end of his talk, he was looking for an apprentice. And I just stuck up my hand straight away. And the next day I dropped out of school and started working on this commission. It was a three year apprenticeship. And it was during that time I began to understand the power of light through glass. And it's an idea that I've been working with uh, ever since. Um, uh, that person in the foreground there is my father. And um, this was just before he passed just a few years ago. And he was in a nursing home at the time. And I went and sprung him out of there for the day and, and took, him, took him out to uh, see these windows for the, for the last time. After I finished my apprenticeship, I wanted to learn more about glass and um, apply to university programs. And I was laughed out of my first interview because I hadn't finished high school. And um, uh, so I went back to night school and completed a portfolio. This is a drawing that I did as part of that portfolio to get to um, finish my high school um, level uh, study and also to develop an art portfolio oh, yeah. to get into the... Um, art school. And as I was looking for a, a program to study, Klaus Moyer had moved to Australia and started a program. And he had actually accepted me before uh, I'd finished high school, um, but I decided to go back and finish high school. I'm on the left, Klaus is on the right. This was in my first year. And um, I, I can appreciate we didn't have a very good fashion sense back then, but we were pretty, pretty motivated to work in glass. And Klaus was a very unique teacher. There were no classes, there were no set projects. He expected us to dedicate ourselves to explore our ideas and undertake testing and experiments and failures and just pick ourselves up and keep going. There was, um, you basically, if you came out of his program, you were self-directed um, from the moment you, uh, you left. And how he set up the architecture of that program was really important. And it was a culture, a culture that many subsequent, all of us as subsequent heads of that program have kept in train as much as we can. You could not start a, a glass program and teach that way these days. They would just run you out of the school, but, um, the, uh, the late Stephen Proctor, Jane Bruce and myself all kept as much as we could of that culture where students were accountable and they were the ones um, driving the syllabus um, for their discovery. 
While I was a student with Klaus, I received a scholarship from the Australia Council, which is like the NEA, to study at the Pilchuck Glass School with Professor Lubinsky and uh, Mrs. Breptova. Uh, during as having that opportunity as an undergraduate was extraordinary. And um, it was the first time in many years that Professor Lubinsky and Mrs. Breptova were allowed out of what was then Czechoslovakia. Um, they had had some problems with the communist government after an artwork they made um, a few, a couple of decades before, and they were only allowed out of the country one at one at a time. So I didn't realize that at the time, but it was a great privilege to work with them. They taught casting, but all of our castings pretty much failed. Um, what the differences between the materials, between what they had available in Czechoslovakia and what was available in uh, the United States was different enough that the works didn't really um, translate, the techniques didn't really translate. Nonetheless, uh, and we did like life drawing for three hours a day, but I was really uh, inspired by them as people and inspired by their approach to material and ideas. They were like Klaus in that, that they had a high respect for material and they were like Klaus in that they were never beholden or trapped by tradition. There was this kind of seamless integration of material and ideas towards new ends. It wasn't about you know, keeping traditions. It was about, you know, what can I do with this craft? How can I take this forward into an expressive um, medium? I'm actually in this photo. I'm this skinny little kid in the white t-shirt in the background. Um, and um, yeah, I was really privileged to work with them. After I finished my undergraduate studies, um, I was offered a scholarship with Bill Carlson at the University of Illinois. And that was a formative experience as well. Bill was a really elastic thinker who had a broad understanding of contemporary art. We also had Chicago's art world on our back doorstep each month and to, to see a whole um, suite of new exhibitions. Um, so it was a really formative um, and long educational period that I had. After I finished my studies with Bill, I taught um, in his program for a year and then um, moved back to Australia. It was at that time I decided to dedicate myself to, um, to cast glass. It was a medium that I'd constantly been drawn back to. And I felt that um, it was also a medium that uh, I felt at the time was really underdeveloped. I still feel that today. It's a medium that uh, has not had a critical mass of people engaged with it. So I moved back to Australia in the mid 1990s with my then girlfriend, uh, Anne, um, and she's the one on the left in case you were wondering. And um, uh, in that time, Australia had become quite well recognized for contemporary glass, particularly for the stream of students coming out of Canberra. And I started working in cast glass and I thought it would take me a couple of years to start to realize my ideas. You know, I had to build a studio. I was still learning to be a teacher, which was um, a long apprenticeship as well. Um, but uh, it took 15 years. It, you know, this is the first body of work in around 2010 where I felt my ideas were starting to catch up the work was starting to catch up with the ideas. It had just been such an extraordinary slow process, not only building a studio, but actually getting enough um, engagement with the material. So the work actually started to have its own vocabulary and actually start to be um, articulate. Uh, glass casting, for those of you who don't know, is painfully slow. There's the whole mold making process there is, um, you know, I, I, I liken it to bronze casting on Valium. It's just so glacially sh slow. It's not just the annealing times, it's also the, the cold working. This was a work that I finished in 2010, and it was about that time, 15 years after I'd been working in cast glass, where I felt my work had reached a, a sense of uh, maturity. Um, with this particular work, um, I was trying to give a sense of shape to light. I was trying to define light or the void in this piece as this uh, palpable positive, um, that that central element, the void is this kind of buried within this rec 
rectilinear form. I'm trying to show how it's subverted and it's pushed under and it's pushed through this block of glass. The edge around that front surface is puckered as if the, the glass is bulging and rippling as the, um, the glass is stretched from the void coming out. At least they're the ideas that I'm trying to evoke. I often use minimal form, forms to frame these voided shapes. Uh, the key elements are, are the voided forms and I conceptualize those first and then think of this simple geometry that serves as a frame. And I'm wanting these voids to, to hover out of the glass as if they are floating. This work uses that central voided form and uses the property of light through the body of glass. The front face of this piece is flat and there's an anterior shape of a compound curve and the in, it's the internal optics of the light not only through the void but also through the glass itself that plays with the sense of shape. The thickest part of the glass in this piece is actually this halo and I've polished that uh, um, face on the back and the light comes straight through it, making it look like a piece of neon or as if it's a quite a, a thin piece of glass. But it, at that point, it's eight inches thick. And I'm often using different surface treatments to try and diffuse and scatter light or push and pull light through. So this is another angle of that form. This piece is uh, still in uh, China at this time. It'll be coming back soon. You can get a better sense of the architecture of this form. So shaping form and shaping light, a shaping form to shape light is how often I often describe my work. Understanding how light um, relates to glass is essential to anyone who works with glass. It can take years to learn that, that dialogue, um, partly because light is so elusive and hard to define and partly because glass is so um, slow to um, uh, muster. But we usually don't see light as it travels through something. We usually see it as a source and when it strikes a, a, a target. When light hits something, it reveals itself, it scatters, it reflects, it reflects, or it does all of these things together. And it was through the traditions of stained glass where I was first introduced to this interwoven relationship. And, um, and I learned that kind of dialogue with translating light. It was when I was at university, I studied different depictions of light as a metaphor for communication, transcendence and knowledge. And as we all know, light is central to many cultures around the world in this way. In the Christian medieval, medieval era, light is seen as a communication from the divine, a connection point to God. It's not surprising that stained glass has its origins in this period and can be seen as the driver for medieval architecture uh, rather than the, the space that was allowed um, by medieval architecture. In this particular uh, painting by Fran Angelico of the Annunciation, he uses, he makes light visible um, in, as a way of depicting the, the, um, the news of Mary receiving the angel Gabriel. Um, Angelico is depicting light to render visible what would otherwise be unseen. And in my own work, I've explored this idea of what is seen and unseen. This is the largest work that I've produced. It's 70 inches tall and it's in the collection here at the museum where I now work. And within this piece, I'm working with ideas of Cartesian theory um, and its relationship to the mind-body split. The voids in this form, there's a void in the top and a void in the bottom. And the, Void in the top is this kind of play at um, consciousness and the void in the bottom is trying to depict this physical life force as a metaphor of the energies that lie within us. We can't see these energies, but we can see them reflected through our physical action. So what I'm trying to do in this piece is you can't see the voids until they're, until they're buried in the glass and they reveal themselves through being buried in the glass. On that front surface, I wanted it to be the, about the size of a human figure. 
And on that front surface, those two um, uh, voided forms punctuate like that first piece that I showed you. They actually pucker up and push into the space. I had to grind that whole surface down using a body grinder and then flatten, flatten it all out. It took, you know, like a month just to do that. Um, and subsequently you learn quicker ways to manipulate this um, really truculent material. Uh, there's also a piece of lead between these sheets. And I really like lead as this kind of separation between the body and the brain, the mind body barrier. And it's kind of like the alter ego to glass. Lead is this um, soft, palpable, opaque material and it does what you tell it to, where glass often doesn't. A key reference for me through, um, you know, I've talked about Lubinsky and Brechtover and some of the people that I studied with, but another person who's had a lot of influence on me is uh, the architect Tara Ando. He's a Japanese architect, and particularly this chapel, which is the Church of Light that he um, designed and was uh, made in 1987. I first saw this church uh, when I was early in graduate school and um, I was just, uh, you know, when you see an artwork and you just go weak at the knees and you're trying to understand why you have such a powerful uh, reaction to it. Um, and, you know, over the years I've understood that it, he's reinterpreted the Gothic stained glass window um, and he's done it in his um, quintessential neo-brutalist aesthetic. The guy is um, using light as this palpable positive and then concrete becomes this kind of the alter ego and it becomes this um, this negative. So it, you know, I couldn't have said that back then, um, but I have referred back to this image time and time again. The good thing about Ando is he is a prolific writer and has written a lot about the philosophy of space and light. And uh, I've devoured as much as I can when his writings are translated into English. This is probably, uh, this is a piece from 2016. So it was uh, 20 plus years after I first saw that, that piece of architecture. Uh, and it's a piece that I think comes closest to Ando's ideas. There's a, a real softness of the light, this negative form that's buried within this piece of cast glass. And, and that's contrasted with this, um, you know, this saw marks on the front and this tooling marks of the production of this work. Part of that was driv driven by the, the way that this piece needed to be made. Um, this piece uh, is standing upright, but it needed to be cast on its back and it needed to be cast at two and a half inches thicker than it currently is. And that's because of a problem with glass called shape induced stress. It cracks your favorite pieces every time. And so I had to cast it thicker and then remove that material. And as I was soaring away, um, I got this really, um, I could see the relationship between the saw marks and this halo that was forming. That was always part of my thinking but um, uh, the saw marks I left in there because they seem to give that sense of contrast that I was looking for. This is a piece called Afterglow. And um, this, is, uh, um, this is a similar idea. Color is key to my work and I'm trying to uh, create the right mood within the work. When I was younger, I was often using very bright colors and um, uh, they would really overpower the negative shapes. And quite often they'd really need to, to scale back the color to get this balance between the voided form and the, the form itself. Over the years I've um, thought more about interior spaces, particularly around the body and trying to visualize um, interior voids that may be part of us and bringing that into the conversation with my work. Um, this new body of work, um, there's, there's more kind of asymmetry about it. There is certainly a sense of, of I'm wanting the interior void to be um, a shape 
that is, I wanted to display it as affecting the outside form as if the void is actually def not only encapsulated, but is actually defining and transforming that ex exterior shape. And that goes way back to my time working with Klaus. Uh, Klaus said, said to us as students, when your piece comes out of the kiln or it comes out of the nila, it's a blank. And that's when the work really starts. That's when you really um, get to affect and, and draw out the personality. I think particularly here in the US, there's been more of a tendency that cold working is a way of finishing. But Klaus and, and um, uh, I've seen a, a, a few other artists, particularly European artists like Franz Xavier Holler, use this work of cold working being this way of transforming shape. This particular work, Cleave, um, was inspired by a chest X-ray that I had. Um, so this idea of these kind of geometric interior lungs um, as part of a health check before I moved here to the, the US. So that's an interject for a moment, Richard, with a quick question for you. Sure. Um, because the, the subtlety of your color gradients is just so integral to the emotion that you're evoking in your work. Can you talk a little bit about how you achieve that? Is that through color placement or through mm -hmm. the cold working process that you're describing? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, there, you know, I do a lot of work with um, bulls. I make my, my colors and uh, quite often I, you know, I'm talking about these kind of tortured grays and um, Sam and the team at Bullseye uh, occasionally, very occasionally make a mistake and they'll show me that mistake and I'll go, yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's a little kind of more, and I'll, I'll talk rather than using descriptions of color, I'll talk in more kind of emotive tones. And I think, you know, Sam's got to know me over the years and has developed a, a palette of colors that, that seem to work. But it's a two-way street. There's the, you know, I cast the form and it's like, well, the analogy that I'll use is this. It's kind of like putting an address into Google Maps, but only putting the suburb in. And so the casting gets me to the suburb and then, um, and then the cold working gets me to the specific address. So I cast it and I get it kind of rough. And then I work with that tonality. Sometimes I thin pieces can't really thicken them up. So if, you, if it's too light, you either have to start again or just accept what you get. But yes, there is a push and pull um, with the um, um, affecting the colors, but also surface treatments, how you um, leave a texture, whether you leave an 80 grit and then buff it with a 400 grit, or whether you bring it back to this kind of satin finish. The, side, the fronts here are all satin, but these edges are polished and that allows more light in, which creates more of a halo around these central forms. So those things I don't plan in advance, they're responding to the, the glass as I have it in front of me. Great, thank you. Yeah, great question. And good time to ask it, because I'm just about to dive into my studio practice and show some of my thinking. Um, I often, I make a lot of models and I do that quite quickly with other materials, um, plastic here, downpipe, and I'm not trying to visualize what the glass will be. I'm trying to visualize what the hole, the void will be. I do drawings. Um, I'm not trying to draw the forms I'm trying to make. I'm just trying to suggest moods or qualities. And I focus on shadows or, you know, an overall quality and then think about ways of uh, generating that into a form. I do a good amount of modeling and I see it as a way of exercising. It's kind of like exercising your artistic cardiovascular system. Um, they're good for getting ideas down and the models hold an idea for you, but models are not to be trusted in glass. Um, they lie and they are just, um, because you can't obviously they're clumsy. You can't visualize the effects of transparency with this process. So quite often I'll do a 3D drawing. I make forms in styrene. I'll work from renderings. And I found the most successful way is to um, uh, 
to keep the process fluid and not rely on one way of visualizing. So here, this is a technique that I've been using for the last sort of eight years or so. I'll cast blocks of plaster silica, quite weak um, concentrations of plaster silica, and then draw onto them and directly carve. Now, what I'm carving is not the form in glass, it, it is what will be the void inside the glass. So here's another example of that, quite a large form cast in um, a weak plaster silica, and then it has to have these very heavy anchors secured into it, and then that has to be secured into a larger mold. This is all plaster silica here, but it's backed up with a refractory castable. Um, a product available in Australia called Shuracast. And, but I cut that with plaster silica to, to weaken it. Um, they have to be really anchored in. It's like when the glass gets around it, it's like holding styrene underwater. And um, I found it much more beneficial to keep the glass out of the mold. There's so much water, chemical and physical water to come out. I dry the molds for days but they still need to um, give off their water without the glass being in contact. So in recent years, I've been using um, filleted um, very large flower pots, which I've just figured out how to recycle with uh, a kiln wash. Sometimes they need to be charged up during the firing process. And then this is a kiln at top temperature. So that's about 330 pounds in there. And that's 70 kilos in there. What's, what's that, about 150, 140 pounds or something. Um, that's a very large kiln. And then that has to anneal for about six weeks. So it's time to go to the beach. I don't really go to the beach, but I just thought it was nice to get a beach shot in there. Or I go and visit my friends in Sydney. Um, this is my favorite swimming pool. I love swimming. And this is the North Sydney swimming pool. If you're ever in, um, if you're ever in Sydney, this is the be be um, pool to go to. It's right under the Sydney Harbour Bridge, just on the North Shore near Luna Park. So after all that playing around, then you get back into the studio, and this is where that conversation of the Google Maps is really relevant. Um, there is a conversation that happens with the translucency and the transparency glass comes out a little darker than you imagined it, you start to think about how these interior forms really start to affect the piece. And the glass shows you those potentials. Um, I discovered, I was introduced to Yahani Palasma, who's a Finnish architect um, a few years ago. And I really uh, enjoyed his writings where he talked about the, um, the relationship between um, uh, touch and, um, and materials and understanding material through touch. You can't intellectualize everything. You have to um, experience. And I feel that the making process is uh, inherent within that. Um, the hand has its own intelligence and the hand shows the mind the potential of a, of a material. You turn it over in your hand, you discover things about the material. It shows you your hand shows your brain the possibilities. And I've never, um, in my teaching, I've never found it very helpful to separate concept and technique. I feel that they're so interwoven that you can talk about them intellectually separately, but where they work successfully is when they're fully integrated. And um, Palasma really helped me make that connection solid. So these pieces come out of the kiln and they're, they're quite raw. You can see here this very large work. It's cast, it's got uh, plaster all over it. And I've been very thankful to work with some extraordinary studio assistants over the years. Um, here in the image, you see Takei Takamura. He's from Japan. He was a student with us. I, I work with Marina Hansa from Austria. Uh, Kathy Newton, who was, um, um, a huge part of my studio practice uh, before I left Australia. And all these people bring their own energy and thoughts to the studio practice. Um, Take and I would spend uh, a long time kind of inventing little tools to, you know, finish particular things. Marina did that uh, as well, as we try and figure out how to 
um, shape and work the glass. These things are too big to lift, of course, so you have to bring the tool to the glass. That's that same piece finished, and you can kind of see that mass of the material, but also that subtlety. I'm wanting that sense of these um, voided forms punctuating, punctuating and, and echoing through the, the form itself. So when they come out of the kiln, they're like blanks that speak to you. You've put, you've done drawings and models, but you need to spend time with them to figure out how they need to be resolved and how they need to be finished. This was the last body of work that I worked on in Australia in 2019. That's um, a very large piece. Uh, it's now in the collection of the uh, Shanghai Museum of Glass. And that's where I did a uh, a solo exhibition in um, early 2019. And that work has come back to Australia, um, Australia, has come back to the United States. It's with my gallery in uh, Florida, Hampson Gallery and Habitat Gallery in Detroit. And I just spoke to um, Corey Hampson um, before the talk today, and he's got the catalogs, leftover catalogs from the show in China, and he's happy to send them out to anyone who wants to make contact. Uh, and he uh, just talked to me about uh, having some of this work represented in Detroit for the 50th anniversary of the Habitat uh, Invitational. We did manage to do a showing down at Art Palm Beach of that work just before the lockdown, um, but we haven't been able to show it since then. A quick question, Richard, about um... Someone is wondering if you're actually cold working the glass before you cast it, or if not, how do you get your bullseye so clean? Um, I, do, uh, I do a bit of both. Um, I do cast elements, cold work them, and put them back in the mold. So I do some of that. I think it's very important to keep the glass out of the mold until it's hot enough to go into the mold. So I I certainly um, use flower pots as a way of separating it. Uh, most glasses are very sensitive to moisture. And so I try and um, keep the moisture away from the glass. I've even pre-fired molds up to a top temperature uh, or a warm temperature and then preheated the glass in a separate kiln and brought that in. I'm doing that at the moment with some lead crystal castings to get uh, a really clear um, casting finish. Uh, but yeah, um, it's complicated and each casting, they use, you, there needs to be kind of a different thinking. How the kiln is ventilated is also an issue there. So there's not just one answer to that question, but it's a good question. All right. And also someone had a question on this slide here. Uh, when you have a, a show like this, do you have to give specific directions on how the lighting should be when the work is displayed or how is that handled? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I generally like to light the back wall and have the light um, bounce through the form. Mm. Um, and that seems to work in most exhibitions. Um, yeah, I didn't have to explain that to the team at Hampson, they just understood it. I think they work a lot with cast glass. So, um, but yeah, rather than put a light on the piece, I put a light um, directed behind the piece and then just use a, a, a little fill light at the front. And that seems to work best. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, I wanted to take you through, this is a piece that I tried to cast in 2016, but because of shape induced stress, this happened and then I scratched my head for a long time and reached out to some friends at the University of Arizona, a guy called Dan Watson, who came to Australia and assisted me with the Delta T approach to uh, annealing. So most of us anneal just by looking at annealing tables, but he started his lecture at a gas conference by saying, how do you anneal 40,000 pounds of glass? Well, how long does it take to anneal 40,000 pounds of glass? And the answer he gave was as long as it wants. And what his point was that you need to measure, you need to measure the cooling temperature and establish your delta T. So this kiln, this is, these are the largest pieces of cast glass in the world. 
um, and look, they're what, 10 metres wide or some ridiculous shape. And this is borosilica. And so I worked with him and others have worked with him uh, to try and translate that delta T annealing into studio practice. So um, that's back in Australia working on uh, systems, working with a thermal engineer in Australia to translate those systems. And we built this interactive um, system where you could put thermocouples in the mold to, um, to get a sense of what was happening in the glass rather than the blunt instrument of a thermocouple just in the side of the kiln. And then over 10 years later, I get back to, um, to being able to make that piece. And it worked out really well. So I'll take you into a couple of research projects that I've worked on. One is this large um, piece of public artwork. Um, the um, power company and the water company in Canberra approached me about making a huge outside piece of glass, sculpt uh, glass sculpture for outside and uh, for a new dam they were making. And I wanted to work with the, um, the image of Lorenz's attractor as um, he, had, uh, because it was for a dam, he had mapped the evaporation currents of water to try and give um, uh, to to uh, which was the basis of chaos theory. And I just love that um, image of the butterfly wings. And so I proposed this form. You know, I quickly talked them out of glass because it was just an impossible project. And um, I said, "Your dam's made of." Uh, concrete, let's make something out of concrete. And I proposed this hollow core casting with this sh um, negative shape inside. And I built a positive version of the negative to show them what the void would look like. And they fell in love with the, ne uh, the positive shape and asked me to make that. So we had to make a model and then we had to make a mold, um, which was quite an undertaking. I had to work with a lot of engineers and uh, engineers are like lawyers for materials. Um, they you kind of hate them, but you have to work with them. Um, that's not true. I, the engineers I worked with were fantastic, um, but that's a, just a joke that I would play on them. And then we had to fill that up with 15 tons of concrete and then lift it with these 200 ton cranes, turn it in the air, and then we installed it. And behind where I've taken this photo from, is 900,000 tons of concrete. And it took them three years to build that dam. And it took me three years to build this artwork. Uh, and underneath this artwork is 18 tons of concrete because they said, when the dam overflows, this sculpture has to stay here. Whereas the bridge behind it is designed to blow away if there's a flood. So in, um, Australia, a big part of my life I started by telling you about was the School of Art. And um, I, it was a real honor to work there for, for so long. That was my colleague, Nadej de Genetez, Phil Spellman, our technical officer, Mel Douglas, there's Kathy, Marina, there's a whole bunch of artists there who are, um, are well known. Um, and it was a privilege to work there for so many years. And and to work with so many students who went on to help shape the program. Uh, you know, they worked within the program and became um, such contributors to um, contemporary practice. The artists that come through there really work on um, developing, their, writing their own syllabus. And it's something that we really prided ourselves on. Um, here are four graduates from just one year. These are all honours undergraduates, Claire Peters, Hannah Gason, Madison Zabel, and Cassandra Lane. They all graduated in honours in, in one year, one of the last years that I taught there. And it was a great privilege to work there for, for so long and to um, see students develop their own voice and, and be a part of the architecture that uh, help them find their way as artists. One of the programs that we ran uh, was a hands-on history where we would take the students to the classic department and they would get to touch pieces of Roman and Egyptian glass. And having that um, experience of not only seeing but, but handling um, 
ancient glass was a great ed educational experience for them. And I, it was a project that uh, Jane Bruce had started. And what I added to that is we would come back to the studio and we would look at historical glass and then pick something each year and then make it. So this is a Hellenistic uh, um, vessel that I would introduce lost wax casting with. So they'd make all the components, make the waxes and then cast the glass. And as a way of kind of building up an appreciation, this was a cameo project, which was um, the student had never cut glass before, uh, a painting student who switched to glass and then uh, developed a whole body of work using this te technique. But one of the um, fragments that's in the collection at the ANU is this um, fragment of cameo from the first century. And I got to handle this and I would look at the surface marks of this thing. And, you know, I'm obviously familiar with the, the accepted thinking is that cameo glass is blown and there's a lot of evidence to, to support that. But the marks that I could see on the surface didn't really align with that. So for example, there's this little bit of blue here, which is at the same level of the white. So if this white was gathered, gathered over the top, that's kind of an unusual thing to happen. And then the thing that really took my attention were these marks on the inside, which have been attributed to cold working. And uh, they're not marks that I've ever seen on uh, a piece of cold work glass. So uh, I talked to my friend who is the head of the research school of physics and engineering, uh, a, a researcher named Tim Senden. And he had developed this machine, which is a high resolution 3D X-ray tomography machine. And I asked if we could put um, the Cameo fragment in there. So we got this scan in 2017. And what you're looking at is the back of that fragment. And you're looking into that, you're looking at the, where the white glass attaches to the blue. And we've been able to turn out the frequencies of the blue glass to, to show you, um, the where the white glass attaches to the blue. So this isn't a cross section. This is actually the whole entire blue um, is, is made invisible and you're seeing the white glass. So the first thing you'll see are these big white, uh, these big wide bubbles. But here, this is about a half an inch tall and this is a depression. It's not a bubble. It's filled with blue glass and it goes in a couple of millimeters, about a sixteenth of an inch. And what's entrapped within this is little particles of white glass. So this glass, this white glass, was Pat de Vere at some point in its creation. And I've been working with Bullseye to, um, to progress this research. It's still, it's still ongoing um, and it's been delayed a lot by the pandemic, but I'm hoping to get back to that. I've been traveling around to different museums and uh, looking at various um, uh, collections of cameos. And sometimes I've, I've found some very good supporting evidence that there was an alternative technique for, for the manufacture of cameos. And sometimes I've found cameos that don't seem to show that evidence. So clearly there's a lot more research to be done there. So I'll just finish up in Canberra. We, um, besides research projects, we also got involved with some extracurricular activities and we would often be entrusted with making high profile awards for visiting dignitaries, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We had a, a scoping meeting where we're like, well, what can we make His Holiness? And um, someone suggested that we, uh, we make world peace for him, but we ended up engraving a bowl. He was very excited about it. And then just before I left, um, we developed for the last four years, we'd been uh, making the, the National um, Australian of the Year Awards. And um, we designed that um, to re represent the multifaceted society of Australia. And um, we put the Southern Cross in there, which is always a, a good seller. And then the Star of Federation in the bottom. And um, my colleague, um, Kathy Newton has taken over that project and she got to make the award for um, Ash Barty, who was the Young Australian of the Year uh, last year in 2020. 
So moving to Corning, New York, um, I left Australia as those 2020 awards were being made and we moved here in the fall of uh, 2019. Uh, there was no um, culture shock. I think there's a really great kind of compatibility between the culture here in Corning and what we were striving for in Canberra. But certainly the weather was a bit of a culture shock. Um, the studio that most of you would know was uh, developed by Amy Schwartz and Bill Goodenrath, and they have established uh, a, a part of the museum that's been here for 25 years and is internationally regarded. Many of you will know the programming that we have, but just a quick overview. There's a lot of teaching, um, artist to artist teaching. That's the lovely Nancy Kellen teaching uh, hot glass skills. There's a fabulous residency program for people all over the world. But soon after I got here, we had to pivot pretty quickly to delivering um, uh, online classes. So we had to conceptualize and um, figure out how to run those classes. And I've shared my time in front and behind the camera learning new skills and reaching new audiences around the world. Uh, we are looking forward to getting back to uh, in-person classes. We've also taken on some commissions. This was a commission that I did for Aldo Baker, who's a Danish designer through a company in Ireland called J Hill Standard. And um, you know, they, um, the company J Hill Standard couldn't find anyone in Europe to make this. So we figured out how to make these kind of interlocking sections um, so it can be production produced. The sections can be um, um, cast and then the glass can be introduced to it and it can be cold worked and put into a production line. So that's the end of my talk. I, I realize we've only got a couple of minutes left for questions, but let me um, drop out of this wonderful photo of the Amy, Bill and uh, our friends here in Corning and um, happily take some questions from you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I do have one question here for you. Um, someone is wondering, how does your work relate to the ways that Lubinsky and Brichtova used voids in their work? Yeah, look, great question. Obviously voids were um, critical within, within their work as well. Um, there's a, there's an, a Czech aesthetic, which is this um, kind of rawness and, and coolness about the surface that I think is one of the fundamental differences. I think there's more of a sense of like the, um, there's a stronger sense of geometry and, and um, uh, in their work and uh, a sense of um, the body in my work. Though, you know, I do see in, in some of um, uh, their later works that there was a reference to the body as well, or that's been suggested to me. And we have a number of attendees that are very excited about Studio Next, which you were showing us at the end there. Uh, is there a timeline for that or when can we look forward to seeing something come together there? Yeah, well, we're hoping to get back to that next year. Uh, I think um, we're still in a COVID uh, uh, restrictions and um, there are conversations that are happening and um, we're hoping to do some announcements, maybe the end of this year or early next year. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on that project already, and I was working on it pretty much full time when I arrived. But all that had to be put on hold as a, re as a response to the pandemic. Um, and Corning will make an announcement uh, when, when the time is right. Uh, we're not progressing it. I'm not working on it at this time. I'm working on other projects, but we certainly hope to get back to it and uh, watch this space. And will the two-year program that you mentioned be linked to a university or just a separate option as um, yeah. it continue? Yeah, uh, um, the plan is not to have it linked to a university and it'd be more like uh, the Jam Factory in Adelaide, uh, Toyama in Japan. They're independent training centers that are able to have a certain flexibility that the university system doesn't have. And I think that for me, that's quite important um, I don't think it's essential. I know the university programs um, are, are important in certain ways. I spent a long time in the university sector, but I also feel that a, a program can focus on more of the fundamentals that I think are so essential to 
a life in, in the industry um, and universities aren't always well set up to deliver those things. Okay. Um, earlier in your talk, you uh, showed us a photo of the large disc in Arizona. Was that for a telescope or what was? No. Yeah, I skimmed over that pretty quickly. Um, they're working on, they, one of their projects they're working on is like a 20 year project which will end up being a 20 year project to make, I think it's six reflecting mirrors at that size for a, a telescope that's being, the Magellan project that's being uh, made, a telescope's being made in for Chile. And then, you know, they make a mirror. When I visited there, I think each mirror was around $30 million and that was years ago. So um, those telescope mirrors are very slow. You know, you want to, you want to learn about patience. Yeah, um, you just need to go there for a little while. But yeah, it's um, they they not only cast them, they also do the cold working, um, and they have their technology has developed uh, a number of times. Karen Lamont and I went there. Steve, her husband, and I went there in 2017, and we had a meeting with Dan and a, a few other people. Dan has since retired, but. Um, yeah, we're just really interested in the the way that they've taken simple principles and just made them very articulate to be able to achieve those. It seems like a whole nother universe to us, but the principles are actually quite simple. Um, they're just very well done. Uh, someone also would like to know, have you tried making 3D models and 3D printing to visualize light flow through white or clear plastic? Yeah, um, I have used 3D models. I haven't cast anything in clear plastic. And my thinking around that is like, yeah, I could do that. But by the time I do it in plastic, it takes almost as long to do it in glass. Uh, it's only a little bit quicker than doing it in glass. So I haven't gone down that road. I have 3D modeled and I have cut things 3D, um, you know, one-off molds in 3D CNC bits of um, styrene and then invested those. And I found that quite helpful, but I also found that it can be a real trap to rely on a particular technological process. And um, I, I found it quite important to try a number of different strategies to visualize the same idea, because you kind of see it from different perspectives. And that helps you imagine how this piece is going to um, look when it's finished. My finish works, I, I think that, you know, that, you know, Stanislav Lubinsky had this incredible ability to draw what he, he these, these um, visions that he had. And his, his partner, his wife, had this incredible ability to translate that. And that, you know, that kind of connection between those two is one of the most unique artistic expressions I've ever seen. And um, I feel that uh, that is... Um, that is where their real innovation lay. Um, my own work was, um, I think I, f you know, find I kind of stumble around at a number of different ways to try and achieve that. I don't have a system for doing that. I try a number of different strategies to um, visualize my work. Okay. And in terms of uh, the new developments at Corning, someone is wondering, are there also any plans to enhance the visitor learning experiences uh, when people visit the museum? Yeah, um, that first po point about right-sizing the museum, the make your own glass facility is overrun in the summertime and we need to right-size that facility. You know, I love the fact that um, people who have never touched glass before can come here and have their first experience with glass and superstar international artists can come here and do a residency and we're all under the same roof. And I think that kind of um, breadth of embracing of, of different um, artists, at different levels, all different levels is one of the real um, opportunities of this campus and, and unique around the world. Um, someone is also asking about the financial goals with regard to Studio Next and uh, where you guys stand there. Yeah, I, I, that's probably one I'll, I'll put a pass on. Um, that's not really my area. 
Uh, Amy's handling that. There's a lot of fundraising that's been happening in, in the background and um, there's a, there'll be a public ask in the future, but that's not really my area. I'm working on programming and helping realize um, the programs. And we'll get back to that in earnest uh, just as soon as we can. Okay. And someone is also asking about the uh, cast castable concrete that you mentioned yeah. and how you adapted it for reinforcement to your molds. Yeah, so um, Matt Perez was a Fulbright, Fulbright fellow with us in Australia and he helped, I had experimented with it. I'd been speaking to people like Dan Clayman who is using a product called KS4 quite successfully in his cast work. And, and I tried similar products in Australia and I could not get them to work. Uh, Matt Perez was with us and he's like, look, um, let's get a range of different materials and cut it with plaster silica and see if we can use it. These materials are so hard that quite often they break the glass even though they're protected by a layer of plaster silica. So you have to weaken them. They're, these are the materials that you use to cast glory hole doors and uh, furnace liners and things like that. And they're difficult to use, they're hard to mix. Um, and I had to experiment quite a bit with Matt's help and we got it to work. And uh, you know, once we got it working, and then of course it's easy. Well, it's easier because you know what you're doing. And um, quite often we'd, uh, mixing it up is is problematic and uh, Kathy Newton and I would spend hours ramming that stuff in and around forms um, but it worked really well you'd only need like an inch of it and it would hold 300 pounds wow. of glass no problem wow. and it would just break away when you were finished mm -hmm. interesting uh, another thing that you mentioned in your talk was the common sort of thread of people, uh, artists from Australia, really being inspired by the landscape. Mm. Um, what about the educational approaches of Australia versus the US? Do you see any big differences there or is yeah. the approach similar? No, I think that's a great question. I, I think one of the good things about Australia and the bad things about Australia is it's a long way from anywhere else. And so it tends to be quite isolated. Uh, when I was, you know, you know, a kid, I think there was more of an emphasis of looking to Europe and the School of Art was bringing in a lot of European masters who had this kind of relationship to material. America went in a different direction, particularly in relationship to glass education. They saw it as like an extension of sculpture. Uh, we, we wanna make art. Whereas the Australians were kind of in this halfway house. They were really interested in what was happening in America because that's where all the energy was but they were drawing on the European traditions in a different way, I think, to what they were here. So, you know, that's not an absolute, but that's a big generalization. And, and I look at programs like Canberra where Klaus was, and we had this respect for material and we learned about it. We learn about cold working, we learn about fusing and casting and glass blowing, but we weren't, um, it wasn't, you know, in the traditional kind of European um, a guild. It was it was more of an expansion, expansive way. Whereas I saw a lot of programs here would jump very quickly to this idea of individuality and and not necessarily invest in the equipment or the the deep training of material knowledge. So um, that's a bit of a generalization, and there's lots of exceptions that people can point out, but that's the kind of um, separation that I see. All right, well, thank you very much, Richard, for being with us today. Your mastery of form and transmission of light is just exceptional. And the way it imparts almost a sense of weightlessness to your pieces, knowing the size and the weight of them is just truly phenomenal. So thank mm. you for sharing with us today. It's a pleasure, Demetra. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right, bye-bye everyone, thank you. Richard and Demetra, thank you.